When Julia Adler unearths the corpse of a famous actress from the 30s in her family's theater, what was previously thought of as a disappearance is revealed to be a murder. With the board of directors trying to push her out and the theater's reputation on the line, she looks to you to discover the truth about this cold case investigation. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I'm super excited to tell you about today's sponsor, a sponsor that put together this lovely little tale of murder and cold case corpses. So whether it's a date night or a game night, Hunt a Killer brings people together by challenging them to decode ciphers, examine clues, and solve puzzles. It's like an escape room, only delivered right to your door. Hunt a Killer isn't even just about solving a murder. This game tells an immersive story that you'll learn about the backstories of each of the suspects, their complicated relationships to the victim, and watch everything unfold as you complete each episode, or each box. One of my favorite parts about Hunt a Killer is that you can join their spoiler-free community with thousands of members to help each other solve difficult puzzles and talk about true crime. And part of the proceeds of every box goes to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that is dedicated to helping with real-life cold cases. John E. Douglas, the inspiration for the Netflix show Mindhunter, is the chairman of the board. Personally, I've been really wanting to work with Hunter Killer because it seems right up everybody's alley, plus it seems like something fun that I can actually bring to you guys that I know is really quality, and it's something that many of us can be able to do online together via Discord or whatever you happen to use to talk with your friends. Right now, you can go to HunterKiller.com slash MrCreepyPasta and use code CREEPYPASTA for 25% off your first box. Again, make sure you use code CREEPYPASTA for a 20% off discount and find out if you have what it takes to hunt a killer. The hook fell on a Wednesday. And it took Davis Nielsen. Davis is an army veteran. His wife and kids, but spends the majority of his days down at the Rotary Club playing poker with his buddies and drinking stale beer. He drives an old flatbed with rust-colored peeling paint, and he lives somewhere between the cornfield and the farm stand. The way Nielsen's friends tell it, Davis wasn't having a good night. Got, got poor hand after poor hand, bad bluff after bad bluff, and by the end of the night, he owed just about everyone quite a bit of cash. Davis's best friend, Charlie Danes, walked back to his truck with him. He claimed Davis was pretty mad about the way the card game shook out. Charlie wanted to discreetly offer to pay part of the tab. You're talking, you know, Charlie told me as he sat across my desk at the Habitsville Gazette office. I was trying to push a couple bills into his hand. Davis wouldn't have it. And he said so, too. He said, said I'm a grown man, blah, blah, blah. I can, I can pay for myself and all that stuff. And they kept bringing up how he, he thought Bill Weathers was cheating. So, you know, he was pissed. And I thank you for the details, Mr. Danes, I said with a polite smile. But let's try to keep the story moving. Charlie cleared his throat. <clears throat> right, right, okay, uh, he said. And then he paused, like he didn't want to get to the next part. And honestly, after hearing what he had to say, I don't blame him. He had mid-sentence... When the damn thing came down, Charlie shook his head, one hand nervously petting his scraggly beard. I don't want to make any sort of sound. Howling Davis even knew it was coming. It was dark out, so I, I couldn't really make out what it was until... Until... He cleared his throat. Until he went through his back, the tip came out the front of the chest. I stopped what I was writing in my notebook. I even put down my pen. I'm sorry, I said. Um, what exactly came out of his chest? It was a hook, Charlie said. About this big, he added, holding his hands apart. About the length of a loaf of bread. It was on a big wire or something coming down from the sky. It got Davis on the line, just sort of stopped talking, and... The blood started gurgling out of his mouth like a like a baby spitting up, and then, and then, and then, Charlie stopped himself, his mustache quivering with the shallow breaths he was taking. 
I'm, I'm sorry, he said, laying his hand on his chest. I've been having chest pain since it happened. The doctor says it was stress. Well, don't worry about it, I said. But, um, what happened next? Well, it went real quiet for a minute. It was dark. And there was just this one street light outside the rotary. Dave's shirt was gray. No, green. A real dark forest green. The blood spread slow. And, and the end of the hook didn't stand out so good. We all sort of looked at it. More surprised than anything. Charlie shifted in his seat. I could see his hands clasping and unclasping. The thin sheen of sweat beating over his upper lip. He pulled his baseball cap down tighter so there was more of a shadow in his eyes. And then, and then, well... He took a deep breath. It lifted him up. I blinked. It... Lifted him up? Charlie nodded. A desperate, scared nod. Like, suspended him. Off the ground? I asked, picking up my pen again and scribbling in earnest. No, Charlie said, his voice coming out as a croak. I lifted him up. Well, on and on and on, up up to the damn sky until I couldn't see him no more. Then Charlie and I had a moment of silence of our own. A spasm built in the back of my throat, but the look on the man's face told me that this was no laughing matter. And then? I asked. Then I called the police, of course, Charlie said, clearing his throat. They didn't believe me, not that I blame them. Probably thought I had too much to drink. There wasn't any sort of evidence, but just a bit of blood in the dirt. Dave's, he, he was gone. Totally gone. He nodded towards the stack of papers on my desk. I read a bit of the work you do here, so I figured if anybody else thought I was out of my gourd, I'm... My well th see what you think. I wasn't sure how to respond to this. So I knew better than to assume the man was crazy, but the the alternative was much worse. So instead of saying the thing I was thinking, I said the one thing I always say to people who come to the Happitsville Gazette office looking for Sam Singer. I'll look into it. I started with the police department who have seen their fair share strange and unexplained, but this story was too much for even them. They didn't suspect Charlie of any foul play, but they didn't believe his giant skyhook tale, so they chalked up his report to an old buddy trying to cover for his friends, skipping out on his wife and kids. And as for the wife and son themselves, they weren't too brokenhearted about Davis being gone. They couldn't get them to talk too much, but from what I understand, Davis was far more interested in other hobbies than being a family man. So he wasn't around much, I said to Deborah, Davis's wife, as she stared at me through her screen door. I hadn't been invited inside, but that didn't mean I wasn't going to ask a few questions, as long as I was there. He wasn't around at all, Deborah said with a scoff. He was always at that rotary club, or fishing in the lake, anywhere but here. I could hear her kids' cartoons playing somewhere in the background. If what Charlie had told me was true, the kid wasn't abandoned. Their father was more than likely dead. Mm-hmm. I said with an absent-minded nod. I jotted a few notes down in my notebook, but honestly, I wasn't getting much from this home visit. Even less than I got from the police. Though it was going to be difficult, I feared I was going to have to tell Charlie the truth. But I couldn't help him. Thank you for your time, ma'am, I said as I turned to leave the Nielsen house. And then... I stopped. There's something about what Deborah Nielsen had said was odd. He was always at the Rotary Club. Or, fishing at the lake. The lake. Now, there are many bodies of water in Habitsville, mostly small creeks and a few ponds, but there's only one place that we ever referred to as the lake. Uh, Mrs. Nielsen, I said quickly, stepping back towards the door. The woman came back into view behind the screen, looking impatient. When, when you say your husband was always fishing at the lake? I paused. Do you mean that Mr. Nielsen was fishing in Lake Lura? I hadn't expected her to laugh, but that that's exactly what she did. You should see your face, kiddo, she said, 
Don't tell me you believe all that small town superstition. Davis sure didn't, and I don't neither. She chuckled one more time, and then her grin fell, and her mouth hardened into a thin line. Davis didn't disappear in a lake. Fairies and leprechauns didn't drag him off, and I'm sure as shit, Santa had nothing to do with this, if you want to jot that down too. She turned her head over her shoulder, back towards the sound of the cartoons and the TV. When she spoke next, her voice was low. David Nielsen was a lousy husband and father. He's taken his son to one ball game, maybe to walk around the forest once. He's a deadbeat. She practically spat that last word. Then she shook her head. He's told me he's walking out on us about a hundred times. Looks like he finally did. And then the door shut behind the screen. If David Nielsen had had any other fishing hole, my investigation would have ended right there. Between the lack of evidence and tipsy witness, there was no reason to think anything out of the ordinary had happened to Davis. But Lake Laura changes everything. If you've read my other account of the strange happenings surrounding Lake Laura, you too might share the feeling of dread that gripped me as I left the Nielsen house. It's a mysterious pool hidden in the woods, where no one dares swim or drink, not even animals. People go missing around Lake Lura, or lost objects float to the surface, and no one in the history of Habitsville has ever truly found the bottom. Or, if you're me, you fall into the water and nearly drown, and of course are treated to a disturbingly realistic vision of your own death. At least I've convinced myself it was a vision. But all that's besides the point because Davis Nielsen was nowhere near the Lake Lura when he disappeared. The Rotary Club's at least eight miles away. Even by the time I got back to the Habitsville Gazette office, I couldn't shake the feeling that the lake wasn't just a coincidence. There's no such thing as coincidences, as far as I'm concerned. And that's why, once I got to my desk, I called Charlie Danes. He answered on the second ring and immediately asked me if I found anything about Davis's disappearance. And I felt a little bit guilty when I said no. There was a disappointed silence, but then I asked my question for the reason I'd called. Charlie, did you ever go fishing with Davis? The other man said nothing, but it wasn't the ordinary quiet of idle conversation. This was a heavy pause where something unsaid hung in the air. No. He answered in a hushed voice. Why not? Uh, not much of a fishing kind of guy? I asked, probing carefully. There was another long pause. There just ain't many good fishing spots in town, he said gruffly, his tone dismissive. Well, uh, apparently there's one good place, I said. Mrs. Nielsen informed me that Davis likes to go cast a line in Lake Lura. Now this was the longest pause of all. A deafening quiet. So still I could count each individual crack of the telephone line where Charlie's stubble brushed the receiver. Then the man spoke. I always told him he was stupid for going there. I had been speaking slowly and deliberately, trying not to betray too much earnest. But when Charlie started to admit that there was something off about the lake, Something he might have warned Davis about, I jumped at the chance to find out more. Why, Charlie? I asked quickly. Oh, I mean, why is it stupid to go fishing in Lake Lura? Silence. Uh, I, I gotta go. I got something over the stove. Click. I spent the rest of my day at my desk debating. The evidence was stacking against Davis and against Charlie's completely bizarre account of what had happened to him. Davis's family wasn't interested in getting him back, neither were the police. If anything, I should be suspicious of Charlie. In any other town, he would sound psychotic, but not in Habitsville. As my co-workers left and the sun set, there was only one thing for me to do. The drive to Lake Lura was rough, and at a certain point, I had to get out to walk. Though it's been almost a year since I've traveled the woods around the lake, I still knew my way around. I couldn't forget it if I tried. 
That didn't mean I was surprised when I actually saw the lake itself. I had forgotten that for all of its stories and superstitions, it was only a small pool of water. The closer I got, the more I could recall the, the feeling of it. The eerie silence of the woods surrounding it, like every living creature was holding its breath. The glassy mirrored surface that never wavered in the breeze, and of course the dark murky water that went down, down, down endlessly. But there was something else there too, something I hadn't expected. Charlie. Sitting on the bank of the lake was Charlie Danes. He was holding something in his hands, something small, and as I neared closer, I could see that Charlie Danes was staring down at a fishing rod. A child's fishing rod. Mr. Danes? I said. He didn't answer. Charlie. He didn't look up, but he spoke. Do you know what happens when you cast a hook in the Lake Lura, boy? My heart rate sped up at the way his voice growled, low and grave. No, sir. I, I don't. I say if you cast a line in the Lake Lura, he said. The fish gets angry. Charlie still didn't look away from the child's fishing rod. And I didn't look away from him. I was confused, to say the least. Boy needs his father, he said quietly. And then, somehow, I knew. Charlie's hand started shaking, and his head was low, and at first I thought he might be crying, but when he finally lifted his face, I saw his skin flushed with fury, his teeth grit with anger. I told him not to fish here. He yelled at me from the other side of the lake. I told him that. I told him. Before I could say anything, Charlie stood up and reached for the rocks that littered the bank of the lake. And with as much strength as he could, he started throwing them against the water's surface. The rocks cracked into the liquid like breaking glass. And all the while, Charlie was yelling a frenzied morning string of obscenities and regrets. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve... I should have... Charlie, I called to him, but he didn't look at me. He was breathing hard, and after he threw the last rock, he looked around for more, but found none. And then he picked up the child's fishing rod again. He stared at it for a minute, grunting with exhaustion and anguish. Then he raised it above his head, and he threw it into the center of the lake. For a moment, it just floated on the surface. It was a kid's fishing rod, after all. Not a very expensive one. My guess was that Davis had gotten it for his son for maybe one fishing trip, and then... never went again. But of course, his son never forgot. We stood there for a moment. The water settled back to stone. Charlie and I on either side. Charlie! I called out to him. You need to calm... I was interrupted. I was interrupted by something terrible. It was huge, wet, and dark. It rose out of the water so quickly, I only caught a glimpse of it. Waves crashed on either side, splashing my legs, but all I could, all I could look at was the awful, gaping maw that came from the depths. It didn't have teeth. I don't know why I expected that it would, like a, like a huge earthworm. It was all gums that had skin that looked like rubber glistening and gelatinous in the light of the sunlight. Like the exposed blubber of a whale. I braced myself for death, braced myself to see Charlie die, but neither death occurred. Instead, the mouth closed around the floating fishing rod and sank back beneath the surface. Charlie and I said nothing. We only shuddered. Charlie collapsed onto his knees, his jeans darkening on the soaked sand. I was in shock, there was no doubt about that. Which is why when I started to see it come down from the sky, my mouth couldn't form words. I couldn't yell out. I couldn't warn him. I didn't... I don't think he, he even saw it coming. 
but nonetheless swinging down from above came the hook. In the stillness of Lake Lura, I could hear the sickening squelch it made as it entered through the back of Charlie's chest, and I could see the red tip emerge from between two buttons of his flannel. Head shaking violently, he looked down at it. He gurgled only once, a scarlet drip working its way down his chin, and then... Then he turned his head to the sky. Charlie Danes was hoisted up by the hook, and he just kept going. I stared into the coming dusk for long after I could see him anymore, and long after I might have been able to tell exactly where he went. I came back to Lake Laura at dawn the next morning. I didn't even look at the water. I didn't think about the fish or why it took Davis Nielsen instead of his son. Instead, I took a hammer and I sunk something into the ground right on the bank of the lake. A wooden sign I had hand-painted the night before. It read, No Fishing Allowed. I turned to leave, hoping, praying that this time I would truly never return. And then I heard it. Unnoticeable at a normal pond. But at Lake Lura, you take note of any noise that breaks the perpetual silence. A distinct splash made me turn my head in horror, afraid that the monstrous mouth had broken the surface once more. But what I saw was much smaller. Tiny, jelly-like creatures skating along the water surface, perfectly at ease. It was rubbery, slimy, had no eyes or fins that I could see. Just a mouth that kept opening as it swam, toothless and wide. I left quickly and quietly. I knew I had seen something frightening, something more terrifying than the humongous creature I had seen breach the top of the lake that evening before. I had seen something even more disturbing than the image of Charlie yanked up into the sky on a metal hook. Something worse still than his feet dangling helplessly, one shoe untied as he was pulled up and out of existence. I'd seen a baby. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to wish you a very well, we're getting close to October. <laughs> Are you as excited as I am? Also, thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you're listening on Spotify. The summer is finally coming to an end, and that means we're moving into the fall. And as we get further into the fall, for those of you that live in cooler climates, you'll probably like to have a nice cup of tea. To get a nice cup of tea, my wife sells it. It's at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get a whole bunch of different teas there, including creepy pasta based teas. My personal favorite is the Dark and Stormy Night, which is why you can get a sticker of me on it. And if you do buy that one, you can always ask for that sticker of me doing a little dab. And you get a special dab sticker. Also, I want to give a very big thank you to all of my Patreons over there on Patreon. Because you guys have helped me out quite a bit. Like... Not, I get, I'm not even quite a bit. You guys are like, honestly, you guys pulled me out of an incredibly dark place when I first had to look at moving and all of the demon stuff that YouTube does. And thank you guys very dearly for all the help that you've given me. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Mitz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, also Dotrade, Payne, Nessie, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Suzaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Fay Lockett, Miss Xander, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Once again, 
Thank you all so much to everyone who is in this list of names that I mispronounce and everyone who's in the description and everyone who supports me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I can't thank you guys enough for listening, for watching, and I wish you all sweet dreams. Good night, everyone. <laughs>